Hello. Hey, is this Lauren? Hi, yes it is. Hey Lauren, it's Laura. Hi. Hey, good morning. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm great. How are you? I'm good. Where are you where are you at right now? I'm from Maine. Mm. You're not far from me. I'm in New Hampshire right now. Oh really? Yeah. <laughs> I'm here That's like cool. staying with, with my brother for a few weeks and his and my nephew. That's awesome. I yeah. was actually just in Boston yesterday. That's so cool. I was just in Maine. Where did we go to um starts with an A, but it's um not oh, I guess. Augusta, is it? Oh, it is. Yeah. It's like the easiest one. That, I just forgot. It's Augusta. That's my hometown. No. That's where I am right now. No way. <laughs> that's funny. I was totally there. <laughs> that's uh, awesome. That uh, is, so, is Maine um, where you went to school? Yes. Yes. Yep. And I you, grew up you, in Maine. And you are OT, is that right? Yes. OT, yeah. Me too. Cool. Mm, so, you've graduated, you finished your boards? Yep. Okay, congratulations. How'd that go? Thank you. It went. Um, luckily, <laughs> I passed on my first time, but mm. it was Good a lot of stress. Job. Oh my gosh. I was yeah. so, I swore up and down when I left my board test. I seriously was just like, I failed. Like, I just knew it in my heart. I was like, I failed, I failed. I was so sad. And then I got the score mm -hmm. back, and I scored really high. Like, higher than most of my friends. And I was like, I would have sworn to anybody I had to retake that thing. I thought it was so hard. <laughs> That's how I was, too. Yeah. My family kept telling me, oh, you passed. And I was like, I really don't think I did. Like, <laughs> yeah. I did not think I passed. Mm -hmm. oh, well, good job. So, I did such a similar thing yeah. to you. Because I started traveling, right, as a new grad. Um, uh -huh. So, So, tell me, like, where you're at with researching that or, like, do you know you want to travel or you're just thinking about it and want to learn more? No. So uh, I've known I want to travel for a while. That's actually been like my plan, I would say, since the beginning. Mm -hmm. My teachers always did the whole, you really shouldn't travel as your first like first year. Like you should get experience. And I understood that. Um but my last clinical, like both my clinicals, I didn't do them in Maine because I knew I didn't want to stay here. Mm -hmm. I did the first one in Boston, which I loved. And I had family around me, so that one was different. But my second one, I did in Plattsburgh, New York, which I didn't know a single person. I was the first one to go there for my school. Mm -hmm. I had to do all the research myself, like find my housing talk to my super like all this stuff and throughout my experience my supervisor wasn't really helpful either so I had to do research on my own and ask questions then and it really justified that I could do traveling right out from school yeah. that I had this experience that I was able to even though I didn't know anybody I was able to make friends and the biggest experience I got from that was all the amazing people that mm. I met yeah Yep. You oh. are going to love travel. And you've already gone through finding your own housing, which is sometimes the biggest pain point. So yeah. you, you're going to rock it. That is awesome. So do you have any um, specific questions or do you want me just to give you some tips about traveling as a new grad? Or um, I'll let you ask questions first and then I'll fill in gaps where I see them. Um, so I don't really know what I have questions. Um I'm kind of, like, I'm at the beginning of researching because I was going to start before, but then I was like, as soon as I started, people were like, okay, well, when do you want to travel? And I was like, I don't know because I don't know when I want to, pa like, pass my boards. I don't know yeah. all this thing. So now it's really when I'm doing the research. Yeah. Okay. And I'm just trying to figure out, like, which, like, I know it's all about the recruiters, but also, like, companies. And I was looking on your website, and I never even knew that you should have two recruiters like I yep. thought it was only one like it's pretty much I'm new to everything yeah so the first thing is don't worry you will not learn all of it before you start traveling and that is okay it's there's no way you will <laughs> so the, you will make some mistakes along the way but it's part of it and I think yeah as someone that loves traveling and new adventures like you get that, like going into it, you're like, it's. N I'm not doing this because it's the easiest thing ever or because I'll make no mistakes. I just want the excitement and to meet new people and mm -hmm. see new things. So 
just don't worry. Yeah. Like already expect there'll be gaps you don't know when you get started. I didn't know almost any of this until I was like two years into traveling. So you're going to be like way ahead of where I was because when I started, I just like first recruiter that called, I only talked to that one. I made a lot of mm. mistakes, but you'll do better than I did. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I'd say, um, so first, just as a new grad, things to think about. When you are, you definitely should work with more than one recruiter. Your main priority um, is going to be whatever it is normally, like whether you want to travel for location, whether you want to travel for pay, whether it's a certain clinical setting. Um, but the other thing that's always going to be a priority for you starting out is the travel team or the therapy team where you're working. So when you're interviewing for these jobs, you just want to make sure that the jobs have a team because there's a lot of places that bring in travelers where you would be the only OT in your first year. Mm -hmm. You just don't want to not have that mentorship in house. And so, yeah. um, and so if you have more than one recruiter in their databases, they have different jobs. They'll have some jobs that are the same, but then they'll have their own jobs that are their exclusive jobs. So the more opportunity you have to find those places that will allow a new grad, just the more opportunity you have. So just know it's normal to have two recruiters. Um, and if a recruiter is trying to make you feel bad about that, they're not a good recruiter. So you can be like, okay, like I shouldn't work with you anyway because you're trying to guilt me. So that's completely uh -huh. normal to work with too. Um, the hardest part I think of traveling as a new grad is just knowing the boundary of like ethics, like when to say no and when, it's, when to say yes when things are more in that gray area. And, and okay. so the biggest thing is just to make sure you have someone you trust that can be your, like, clinical mentor um, that's, like, outside of where you're working and everything. Because I remember one of the jobs I had, I walked into it, and it was my first time ever working in a, a skilled nursing facility. And mm -hmm. so I didn't know, like, anything about what productivity to expect or anything at all. And there was a huge team. And so I go in and I get handed the schedule like on, on day two or three because they don't give you a big orientation at all when you're a traveler. And it was huge. Like it was pages and pages. But everyone else got that same kind of like long list. And all they did, this is a long time ago back when we could do group therapy. And it was all they would do is just group people up and I can never get people's charts. And it was so chaotic. But everybody else was doing it. And I was like, Maybe this is how it works in SNFs. Like, I don't know. And I would ask the other OTs in, in the clinic, and they were like, oh, just do this. Like, they were cutting corners left and right, and it didn't feel right. But I was so new. Mm -hmm. Like, I wanted to just say yes and, like, go along with it. And But I ended up calling um, my old professor and just, like, telling him the numbers, telling him what was happening. and be like, it doesn't feel right, but, like, there's, like, 20 other therapists here doing this. But sure enough, he was like, that's your license at this point. Like, you you get to decide – when to say yes and when to say no and and so it was my first time to like it's the only time in my whole travels I've ever left an assignment but um but yeah but if I hadn't had that my old um professor to call I would have had no clue and so yours mm -hmm. doesn't have to be a professor by any means but just making sure you have somebody that's an OT that's done it in that setting so you can just call them randomly if something comes up that you're like, I don't know if this is like how it works really in every place or if they're taking advantage of me. Oh, so, yeah. Yeah. Um, That's one of my, so like mm -hmm. for my two clinicals, I did an outpatient setting, which had a little bit of acute, um, but it was more like it was just joints that we would see. And then the second one was in a, in a hospital in an acute setting. So I haven't done it like a sniff yeah which I'm a little concerned about too because I know I'm going to have to like with traveling like most of the jobs are mm -hmm. sniffs. yeah and you'll so. do you'll do great like they're they're fast moving um mm -hmm. but they're not like you'll do great in a sniff but um but you do want to ask in the interviews and I can send that to you too at the end of this is questions to ask in an interview um because you be want awesome. to know what the expectations are of productivity there. So some places will expect you to be at at 90% or more, and that's really hard to keep up with. 
Um, but places mm -hmm. that expect like 80 to 85 percent, that's going to be normal. So that means 80 to 85 percent of your day you're with a patient and the rest of the time they give you for documentation. But if you're on an interview and someone's saying like 95 percent, just know that's insane. <laughs> There's no way. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. And then the, the other piece is just to be honest in the interview. My very first job that I got as a new grad, they knew I, they knew I was brand new just taking my boards. And they were so great to me, and they had a team, and they, they kind of did help mentor me and, like, um, help me out a lot. But they knew what to expect from me. They didn't expect me to come in, like, like as, as good as someone who was, like, years and years doing this. And so I think mm -hmm. just on the interviews, just being honest about where your skill sets are and where you feel confident and where you don't. And I think as long as the expectations match when you get to the job, it will be no issue. But on, on that mindset, so... We also do get paid a lot more as, as travelers. So they uh -huh. do have this expectation of like, we're not here to train you. Like you're here to, to work and see patients really quickly um, because yeah. it's the whole reason they need, they need travelers anyway. And so it's just making sure you take all those school binders and all your awesome stuff that you got at school and take it around uh -huh. with you. And like, at, oh, you know, at home for the first little bit, you'll probably have to go home and like study things as they come up because it'll all be new at that point but um but I had I made this like cheat sheet binder for me when I got started so I had like a page I could turn to to remember the best documentation words quickly and a page I could turn to to remember the two different hit precautions quickly like all these things I just like had in my binder so I was like <laughs> just carried that with me like crazy my first year and it helped me <laughs> so much so you can make one of those with like the most important documents um, that's smart yeah and then the thing with the recruiter so having two is great um, and getting a recruiter that is recommended to you from somewhere whether it's a Facebook forum you can go through Nomadicare and I interview recruiters um, and then the thing about that is when you first talk to them it's just about getting a feel for do the personalities mesh and do you feel like you can trust them and enjoy working with them um, so don't feel like right away you have to give them all your paperwork or anything like that. It's just like kind of feeling it out at the beginning because they end up being kind of your rock as you travel. And you really want to be able to talk to them, tell them when things are going going wrong and in something. Tell them something about your housing. They should be your go-to and super available. So, okay. um, so feel free to talk to like four at first, right, and just get a feel. But then it's nice if you can narrow it down to like two or three because otherwise it gets to be a lot on you to manage more than that, that many recruiters because they call a lot. <laughs> okay. Um, Are the, would you recommend like different recruiters from different companies or is it the mm -hmm. same company? Nope. So one company would have all the same exact jobs. So you would never have more than one recruiter from one company. And actually okay. what's interesting is once you, once you talk to a recruiter from a company – whether it's picking mm -hmm. up a, a phone call from a cold call or anything, they put you in the system as, like, theirs. So then it's even hard to switch to a different recruiter within one company. Um, but you do. You want two recruiters from two totally different companies. And how I typically okay. like to do it is get a recruiter from a big company um, that will have more job opportunities. They just have more resources to find more jobs. And then one from mm -hmm. a medium-sized company um, who also probably will have exclusive jobs in cer certain regions and just try out those two and see how it goes. Okay. So, um, yeah, and that's something I can help you with. I can give you two recruiters that I like a lot. Um, and when you find out which setting you want to be in, I can get you a mentor that will talk to you that's been in that setting. So you at least have a phone number to call if you don't know anybody else that's been an OT in that setting. Awesome. That'd be great. So, okay. so yeah, those are kind of like the things of, of a new grad. But I think really like your personality, it sounds like you're going to just do great. I, I loved it. Like I didn't ever have this time where I was like, oh, I wish I didn't do this. I went too soon. But I also mm -hmm. have the personality for it. Like, I can handle things when they're hard. And 
I, I don't mind hitting the ground running. I like learning on my feet. I don't mind going yeah. home and like making guides for myself. And, um, but I love, like, I love the adventure. I've done it for seven years now. <laughs> I just love That's it awesome. so much. So I think you'll do absolutely great. So don't worry. Um, I'm quite excited. Yeah. You want to learn this thing that's called the tax home rule. Have you heard of that concept yet? You say tax home rule? Mm hmm. Um, I've read a little bit. Is that like, like, technically, I live at home right now and I'm not paying rent, but if I start traveling, I have to pay my mom something mm-hmm. to show that I'm like having another house. Yeah, yeah, kind of. Like, we we have two two options, actually. You can travel with having no tax home at all. It's just mm-hmm. if you travel like that, you're going to get paid like you were a permanent employee, meaning that everything you make will be taxed. Okay. The, the other option you have is to have a tax home. And then we fall into a different category of traveler, where the government, the IRS, looks at us as if we're going away on a business trip. And when people go away on business trips, they can write off all these tax deductions. But us, Mm -hmm. instead of having to write them off, they kind of give them to us up front in reimbursements. So it's like they're reimbursing us for the housing we have to stay in. They're reimbursing us for the meals. They're reimbursing us for the travel from, from Maine to wherever you go. They're reimbursing us for the licensure that you had to get in different states um, mm-hmm. up front, but with the, with the but if you got audited, you'd have to prove that it, you were someone that was within these rules of needing reimbursement, and they want okay. you to get reimbursement only because you're duplicating expenses. They say you're paying rent somewhere at home, you're traveling away from work, we're giving you tax free stipends to help you with that second expense and so if you live with your mom which is totally fine you would just make a lease like you just think of it in the way of like if I was audited knock on wood most likely you won't be but if randomly you did then um, you would just think about it in their terms what would I need to show them to prove this you'd want to show them a lease so you'll just make a lease with your mom to make it official and, and then you want to pay her each month in a way that you could prove it, like with a paper trail, whether it's electronic, whether it's checks, and just prove it. And then, and then that, that's it. And you just have to pay what is they call fair market value. So you have mm-hmm. to pay like what a stranger would be paying to, to book out that room. So you'd look up in Augusta, Maine, like what does someone pay for a room in a house? Is it 400 bucks a month? Okay, that's what I can pay. That's what people are paying. And then all that proof is there. And then whatever happens after that, if, if your mom wants to give you a huge amount of money for a Christmas gift at the end of it, it doesn't matter what she does with that money, but you need the proof of paying that rent. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then there's two other things that sometimes are more forgotten about when people talk about this. Um, one is that you have to go home around 30 days a year so that you're not abandoning your home. That's another rule to get tax-free money. It does not have to so be ha- in a row, just any time, okay. 30 days. So that you just have to show, like, I'm going home. I didn't abandon it. I still live there. Um, mm-hmm. And with that, you also just want to keep all of your paperwork ties to that home. So if you have driver's license, keep it there because that's a great proof to say, no, I live here. My driver's license here. I got my W-2 going there. Um, a mm-hmm. car registration, all of that. Just don't change it as you move and go on your adventures um, because then it just gets confusing in the tax world. They don't care about your story. They're just like, nope, it looks like you moved. You changed your driver's license. So you just want to keep okay. keep everything looking like, yep, that's definitely my house. So and, my only yeah. thing is actually, mm-hmm. so right now I'm living like at my mom's house and then I plan, she's getting married. Oh, cool. And so our house is on the market and she's moving into her fiance's house, mm-hmm. which my all my address and all my billing, like all that stuff, will change to his house yeah. once the, my house sells. But is that going to look? Is he is weird? he still in uh, in the same town? Are they still in Augusta? She's in Hollowell, which is five minutes from Augusta. Yeah, no, that's totally fine. You're still in the same region. Okay. Yeah, that doesn't matter. Yeah, and okay. there there is you can write this down too as an, as a really good resource. It's um, called traveltax.com. 
So the guy oh. that runs travel tax, he focuses only on these travel taxes because our taxes are really different than a normal person's. But he used to be a traveler and his team will always answer the phone and just answer questions for free for travelers. So, and, okay. and he's actually the person that is like a tax expert. So I know these rules from him, from like going to his lectures and, and being friends with him. But, mm -hmm. but he's the one that actually goes into audits and sees what happens. So if you're ever concerned and you really want to hear it from like a tax source, you can always call them. And they're really friendly there. Okay. So, yeah. And wait, there was a third one. I want to make sure I don't miss it. Go home. Paperwork. Um, you just, I think that you just can't stay somewhere over one year. Wherever you travel to. If you do, that place will automatically become your tax home. Because the basis of taxes is where you make most of your money. So if, uh -huh. you, if you end up extending, extending, extending a job, you love it, you don't want to leave California, but you extend too long and you are there for over a year, then automatically that becomes your new tax home. So if you kept staying after that, then your, your stuff will be taxed in California. So that's just something to okay. keep in mind if you're thinking about like staying somewhere for a while. Okay. So yeah, so oh. that's... That's that. So it's not it's not that complicated. I think everyone hates talking about the taxes, but I think as long as you're just paying each month and whatever you and your mom want to do with that is fine, but you just want proof of that, of that okay. payment. Yeah. Lovely. Have you heard anything about Courant Health Partners? Um, other than, really? other than just their name, like just hearing of them? No, I don't know anything specific about them. Okay. I wasn't sure. That was one company that I talked to when I went to the AOTA conference. Yeah. And I really like them there, but I haven't seen anyone talk about them. Yeah, they must and be like, a little bit of a, a smaller, or maybe they just don't have a social media presence. So they could be great. Um, but what's what it really comes down to, which I'm sure you're going to hear everywhere, is a company could be good, and then the recruiter could be bad. And a company could have a bad reputation and the recruiter could be awesome. And your experience of the company is only going to be as good as the recruiter is because it's the only person you talk to. So if you want to talk to that company because you liked them at the conference, uh -huh. I, would, I would go on to a, um, one of the message boards and say, does anyone know of a recruiter they love from this company that I can talk to rather than just randomly calling the company because then you have no clue who will pick up the phone. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I've heard. I heard Med Travelers is a big one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're uh, really big, and I have recruiters I've interviewed from them, so I can get you a recruiter from Med Travelers, which actually okay. you will love her. She's she's so sweet. To, like to travel somewhere. The expense, is that covered or do we cover that? Mm -hmm. Perfect question. So up front, you'll cover it. But yeah. on the very first paycheck you get, which as a traveler, you typically get paid every week, every Friday, which is re really kind of fun. And, um, and in that very first paycheck, most companies will then put the travel reimbursement in there and the licensure reimbursement in there. And so the first paycheck is typically really a big one, so it's really fun to get that one. But up front, mm -hmm. you're paying for it, and then okay. um, and then you get it back. And the thing to know okay. about that, which in the webinar, I talk about this a lot, so you can watch the webinar to get a lot of details about this, but big picture thing to know is that when you go to these conferences like AOTA and, and all of them, a lot of the companies will use marketing terms and say like, your housing is free, um, well, your travel is free, your license is free, we pay for all of this. And mm -hmm. the truth is they don't, none of them do, it's all marketing. How our pay really works is that it's just like a big pot of money and the hospital is paying the recruitment company a big, well, it's called a bill rate, like this big number. And then the company and the middleman, the recruiters, will take what they need to take to pay, you know, run their own business. 
And then what's left mm -hmm. over is our pay rate. And so that pay rate is a big bucket of money that they can move around, not unlimited, but they can move around quite a lot. They're very flexible with it. So different companies will just use different marketing terms to try to get more travelers to come to them. So anything they say is free is most likely, like 98% of the time, coming out of our pay package, not theirs. And so, okay. so just know, like, um, yes, the license is paid for. Yes, the travel's paid for. But ultimately, it was already your money. So they're taking it out of that mm -hmm. pot of money that's already yours and just paying you back for what you paid. Um, okay. which, which means, you know, that, that the money has to come out and then your stipends will be a little bit less or something else will be a little bit less. But that's really normal. Um, but just know, like, just because one company says we do free this and another company says we do free this, they're probably the, almost the exact same. They're just using marketing to see which one you like better. <laughs> okay, sounds good. That makes sense. To, or not easier, but better to find your own housing instead of, Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it, there's two different things. So if you want to make better money, one of the ways that we're able to make better money is by finding our own housing. So the idea okay. there is that if we have a tax home and we travel away from it, we get the tax-free stipend. And mm -hmm. with that stipend money, we need to pay something, but we don't have to pay all of it. And so whatever is left over with that tax-free stipend, we can just keep as extra money. So if you get okay. pretty savvy about finding your own housing, that's one way that you can make better money. So the companies will offer to find you housing, but that means you will not get a stipend for housing because they're using that to find it for you. Um, so it's less time and headache when they do it, and they'll put you in a furnished place, but you'll make less money. But okay. And the other thing to think about with that is when they find your housing, Everything is in their name as a company. So they're taking on the risk of paying the deposits and signing the leases because if a contract gets canceled, which doesn't happen mm -hmm. that often, I've only personally had one contract canceled in seven years, um, but it could. It happens randomly. If your contract gets canceled and you signed a three-month lease somewhere, that could be a pain to get out of, to and pay the fees. Right, but if they do it, they take on that risk and you won't be responsible. Um, so when you're finding your own housing, you can also negotiate that, right, with the person you're renting from and just uh -huh. let them know, like, what the industry you're in, which they'll probably like because they'll be like, okay, you're a working professional. I trust you in my home. Then maybe you mm -hmm. can make a lease that's a little bit softer if a contract's canceled Yeah. Um, for you. So that's okay. just the kind of thing to keep in mind, but... Yeah, most people find their own housing. Okay. And I thought so, but I just wanted to make sure that I wasn't missing anything. Yeah. I've read a lot about, like, people getting their contracts canceled and all that, and that mm -hmm. you should have them put, like, in your write-up thing, like mm, a yeah. notice, like, two-week notice or... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. In, in the contract, you'll see, there's one of two things you'll see typically. Um, it'll be a two-week notice they're allowed to give you if the contract is canceled, or some companies mm -hmm. will do a four-week notice. And, uh, and usually it's, just, it's the same for both of you. So they'll say, um, if you need to quit, you can give a two-week notice or a four-week notice, and then, or vice versa for them. So typically you'll, you won't get canceled and then just be out of a job. You'll typically have at least two weeks to find a new job in that area. And hopefully okay. up to four weeks. But it's just good to know that in your contract. But, and you can try to negotiate it if you want to. But a lot of times these hospitals just have a set, a set thing they do. And they don't really negotiate it. But you at least want to know it. And you at least want to look at the contract and make sure they can't just cancel you and not give you notice at all. Okay. And if you do get canceled, all that happens is you get on the phone with recruiter number one they start looking like crazy. You become their top priority where they're going to look at every hospital, every opening within your region because they want you to mm -hmm. not have to move out of that housing. And then you're also going to call recruiter number two, like the backup recruiter or the two backup yeah. recruiters and say, all right, my contract got canceled. I have to get a job in this region for this start date. And so you have, you know, two or three people hustling, trying to find you a job as fast as they can because you want as many, mm -hmm. as many eyes on the jobs as possible at that point because you don't want to pack up, you know, that early. Yes. Okay. 
Yeah. That helps out a lot. Also, what is that thing? I'm just thinking about everything that I've read, like, on the Facebook page. Yeah. It's been, like, the most yeah. convenient thing I've ever joined. Yes, it's uh, so nice. Negotiating pay, like, what mm-hmm. is, like, obviously, I don't know what is a good pay, and half of it comes from tax-free stipends, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Yep. What I'm... Yep, you got it. So, for negotiating pay... Um, I'm going to send this thing to you too. There's a thing called my pay breakdown guide. Um, mm-hmm. the, the first step of negotiating pay is just really understanding how we get paid and the options of where our money can go. So okay. when you watch my webinar, I'll break it down and I, and I list out all the different places our money can go. So you understand mm-hmm. what is part of your money, what is part of not your money. Um, cause that way you know where you can move money, where you can negotiate. So different things you can negotiate is you can try to get more travel money up front. So if you know you'd rather have a bigger chunk of money on the first paycheck because you're just getting started, you can negotiate Mm -hmm. to move money there, but then they have to take it out of something else. So so it's good to just know, and and there's many other options in that, but I think the thing to remember is you can negotiate where money's moved, but really you can't ever know if you're getting this like great, pay deal because you don't know the bill rate. So the bill rate's that big number the hospital's giving the Mm -hmm. the middleman, and then you get the pay rate. So because most companies don't tell us the bill rate, you don't really know if they're giving you a fair deal because the bill rate will change all the time. It changes like within the same hospital, if it's low season or high season, it changes depending on where you're going to. And so because of that, you just don't want to ever tell a recruiter this is my bottom line of pay. You don't want to say, like, I just need to make $1,500 a week, and that's it. Because then if a really high bill rate comes in, and maybe you can make way more than that, they maybe will keep that extra amount if they're not an honest recruiter because then they can make a little bit more commission, and they think, well, she won't know, and she just needed $1,500. And so what I tell the recruiters when I'm talking to them, I tell them, hey, um, I don't have a bottom line to tell you because most of them will ask you that question, but I'll say, but Mm -hmm. I do want to just make the most money I can make on any given bill rate. And me just saying that to recruiters, they're like, okay, this girl kind of knows what's going on. Like, I better play play nice. Um, Okay. So, so yeah, just, like, keep your mind open. Know know where you need money because you can always ask for it in different places. And then Mm -hmm. working with more than one recruiter helps a lot here. Because if a recruiter knows that you're talking to another recruiter, they're going to want to undercut you a lot less because they know there's competition there. And it gives you a chance to look at two different different offers and see who's giving you the best offer. Even if they're two different jobs, it'll just give you a chance to see like what's in the region and what are what are jobs offering. But when Mm -hmm. you're when you're breaking down that pay, it's just knowing that. When you look at the two job offers, you have to add everything up. You have to add in how much they're willing to give you for travel, how much they're willing to give you for license, and add it all up because it's all part of your pay package. So yeah. does that make sense? Yes, it yeah? does. Okay, cool. It makes a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you so much for answering all those questions. I really yeah, appreciate it. Yeah, I'm happy to. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send you the, the webinar that goes mm-hmm. over that goes over like the getting starting basics because you can you can watch that whenever you get time and it goes into some of this stuff a little bit more and it talks about like the red flags of recruiters to look out for and stuff like that okay. um, and also awesome. do the, the pay breakdown guide because then that's a visual that you can see um, okay here's all the places my money can go and so you kind of know what to ask for when when recruiters are breaking down pay mm-hmm and, and then, do I go online to fill out the recruiter thing? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I can send you a link for that. So I can give you um, two recruiters that, that I think are awesome. And what's nice about the recruiters that I work with at Nomadicare, after you've been matched with them or anybody, then a few weeks later I send you guys a survey. And so I'm able to actually see, like, if the recruiters are really rocking it with you guys. And so mm-hmm. the list stays really good. So I'll give oh, you the ones that um, that I think are the best with new grads, though, the ones that 
really like care about education and making sure you understand it. Um, and then you can always just like stay in touch with me. I'm happy to help wherever I can. Awesome. Thank you so much. I really, really appreciate it. Yeah, I'm happy to talk to you. Good, mm -hmm. good luck with it. And yeah, keep me posted on how it all goes. I will. Have a wonderful day. All right. You too. Bye. Bye.